sweet. Oh, and this is not live. So if for some reason you say something or you, you need to hit, get a call, whatever the case is, I can pause it. So no worries there. I will, I will mute my phone though. Make sure, sure that works. <laughs> no worries. And then, um, yeah, it shouldn't last more than 45 minutes or whatever. Um, I'll try You know, I'll certainly respect your time and try and be done by three. And it's, it's Friday afternoon. I've got time. Beautiful. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and kick this thing off. Welcome to uh, this week's episode. I'm here in Zoom land with Matt Luke, Technical Manager for Renewable Road Transportation at Nesty. Thanks for coming on the show, Matt. How you doing, buddy? I'm, I'm glad to be here. You know, like, like I said, it's Friday. You know, this is going to be a good conversation talking about energy and yeah, happy to happy to hang out. No, that's great, Matt. And uh, I appreciate like we were talking before, there's been a lot of travel happening. It sounds like you travel quite a bit. Um, you know, I was mentioning I was in Oklahoma and, and, you know, just for the audience, I know you already mentioned it to me, but I mean, you do travel quite a bit. And, and so where, where is it that you travel to mostly? So our, our business, um, at Nestle, and we can talk about that in a bit is mostly based on the West coast because uh, states like California, Oregon, Washington have these low carbon programs. Um, so that it kind of drags our market out that way. Right. Um, I spend time on the East coast as well. Um, it's a little Northeast, but also Washington DC doing some support for our public affairs team and you know um lobbying is not the word because if you're not a registered person you're not allowed to advocate but you know just kind oh, of really? uh, okay <laughs> the, the education side of stuff um yeah for the regular regulators and, and other people well no that's perfect and I mean because being Houston like you said you're three hours kind of one way or another so this is a good central spot for you I would imagine and it's I would imagine mostly direct flights so yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm from DFW. Um, so the move to Houston was pretty short. And yeah. then Neste, Neste here in the US, Houston's our only really kind of hub office. Okay. But we pull a lot of people from the oil and gas industry because of what we do. So it, it's kind of, it's a talent rich city for us. So it just yes. makes a lot of sense all around. No, that's awesome, man. And I'm, I'm excited to dive into it. Um, and so really, I guess for the audience out there, like, oh, who's this guy? And how'd you get connected? Um, man, I, uh, so I don't know if I followed you before or after, but I noticed uh, about three weeks ago, uh, and we're, we're recording this towards the end of August, but roughly three weeks ago, uh, you made a post highlighting your experience testifying in front of the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources with a focus uh, in renewable diesel, which which we'll dive into that. But I was like, man, that's so cool. Um, and so then I clicked your profile and I'm like, oh, no way. Uh, you're also a global energy management alumni. And so uh, it just made sense to reach out and, and then, you know, here we are today, but I, I just want to kick it off and, and ask, uh, you know, how did you like the program and, and kind of what made you get into that? I always like to try and, you know, create awareness around GEM because to me, it was a great program. Yeah, no, I think it was really good. Um, and I, there's still people I talk to, you know, every couple of days from the program. And I, I think. Uh oh, oh, no. This meeting is being recorded. Uh oh, I lost you for a second there. I don't know what that was. I don't know. Uh, yeah, who knows? I'll make sure and edit that out. But but yeah. So yeah, go ahead. You said you, you still talk to a bunch of folks at Jam. Yeah, um, just you know, text and email, whatever else. Um, still have some good friends from there. And you know, for me, I started my career as an engineer at Cummins, the big diesel engine company, um, focusing on the oil and gas industry. So like like I mentioned earlier, I've spent a lot of time on drill rigs and frac sites and just out in the field doing engineering type work. And at some point I realized um, I, I like, I like being an expert on something. So, you know, there, so the gym program would definitely provide an avenue to be an expert on something, but also um, just the energy industry as a whole fascinates me, not just one portion of it, right? Not just the oil and gas or just the wind or something, just how it all plays together globally. So when I found out about the program, um, you know, I, I think, you know, um, Michelle and some of the others there that I talked to, it's like, this sounds really cool. Um, they, they actually talked me into starting a, a semester early. So with a cohort earlier than I, I was planning to, and it worked out really well. Yeah, no, that's, that's fa I mean, I can really identify with you. I mean, most of my entire career since I was 18 has been on the drilling side. And uh, it was funny because in my, when I was podcasting for uh, OGGN, I'd went to Denver and one of my contacts got me in touch with Sarah Derdowski and She's like, you got to interview her. She's, she's an awesome lady. She's in energy. And they've got this really cool program that, you know, I'm sure she'd love for you to talk about. And I was like, heck yeah, I'll do it. And uh, so when I was up there, you know, got in, you know, essentially I was interviewing her and then she was kind of interviewing me. And then after the podcast, she was like, you would make for a great candidate. And I was like, I don't know about school, Sarah. I'm like, I'm not uh, I'm like, I'm doing well in my career. I'm like, 
I barely squeaked by in high school and, you know, it, it got my undergrad, you know, after realizing I probably needed an education if I wanted to get out of working drilling rigs for the rest of my life. And uh, yeah, one thing led to the next. And it was actually, I had started the application process uh, in 2005 or it was, it was, it was like 2017, 18, maybe, but and, and things were still going well. And I was like, ah, so I kind of, you know, I, I put it off and then, you know, work got real crazy. Well, then COVID hits and it just hit me one day. I was like, if I'm going to go back to school, now is going to be the time. So I did it. And, and really to, to kind of, you know, supplement what you're saying is, is just, it, it, it was nice to see so many verticals within energy come together. Uh, and it really gave me an understanding of how it all does tie together. And then it just made me so interested in everything else that's happening in the world of energy. Uh, so yeah, again, just, I, I wanted to touch on that. A big shout out to Jem. Uh, Sarah and the whole uh, CU Denver Business School, uh, they do a jam up job. Uh, mine was completely remote. So I'm kind of, you know, envious. I'm sure you probably got to do the experience where the, you know, the cohort weekends and all that, right? Yeah, the, uh, the Denver weekends were definitely fun. You know, the Friday night, Saturday night, going out with the group. Um, yeah. The downtown it was really nice. Um, but like, you're, you know, you mentioned the early schooling and stuff like that, you know, you didn't feel like you're a good student, whatever. When you find a program that's actually what you want to be learning, not what someone's telling you to learn, it really changes stuff. So like it, if, it, if you're electing to go into an energy program, like it just, it makes it so much easier, you know? It does. No. And, and just the, the intent and the interest and the, the, the attention to, to, to the, the details within the programs and the courses, it was like, I didn't, you know, there was a time in my life, mainly in high school, I was like, I did enough just to get by, but I found myself doing, you know, the extras and doing the extra assignments, doing the extra homework, really just because I was interested. And, and then it yielded good results, you know, obviously as well, but it makes a big difference. And there was folks in there that had just graduated from, uh, you know, got their four year, you know, undergrad and they just stumbled in it and, and, you know, nothing against that. I think it's, there's benefit to, to education regardless, but you could tell, sort of the mindset between uh, folks like myself in our thirties, you know, have, you know, quite a few years under our belts versus the ones who just kind of went in just to get their masters. Um, it, there was a bit of a different mindset there, but, but ultimately uh, you know, if, if having the break and then, you know, going back to school for me was, was the biggest benefit. So it yeah, was good. It also let you, it lets you bring in a lot of knowledge from the real world. Yes. You're not just a perpetual student sucking up other people's knowledge. You can actually give out knowledge as well. So it, I think it helps a lot. To, yeah. To and then you, you can, and then chopping it up with the, with the professors too, cause they're working yeah. professionals, most of them. So yeah, it was, it was great. But um, anyway, before we keep going, I do want to remind all the listeners that I'm currently opening up sponsorship opportunities for the podcast. If any energy focused companies are looking to increase their brand marketing initiatives, visibility and awareness around your company's initiatives through the podcast, please reach out to me. I'd love to work with you. Anyway, so Matt, you know, we got to get a little, uh, know a little bit about you, but I want to start off and I normally do with, with a question um, and it'll help kind of peel back the onion a little bit, but what's your ideal Friday night look like? If you had all the money in the world, you could, you could be, you could be anywhere you wanted to with whoever that would be. What would that look like? Man, um, that's a good one. It depends, I guess, if I've, if I've been traveling a bunch lately or if I've been home a bunch lately. Um, yeah. <laughs> two, part, two part answer, I guess. You know, the happy place is just outside somewhere, you know, whether it's somewhere around the mountains, just hiking, being out outdoors, whatever. Um, cool. From around town, though, honestly, I, I, you know, get a lot of work done early in the week. I'd take a Friday afternoon, go to the bow range, do some, do some archery, do some shooting, and then I love to cook. So ah. honestly, just kind of hanging out around the house, making a good meal. I, I just love to cook. Okay. Well, so what's, I mean, if you're trying to impress, you know, a party or a certain individual, what's your go-to? Like, what is the meal that, you know, would just blow the socks off anybody? Man, this is going to sound so simple for anyone <laughs> who cooks. Um, so carbonara, right? It's a pasta dish. There's only a few ingredients in it. Give you noodles, cheese, your meat, and, and some egg. Yeah. And it, it just, to do it right though, it's the timing and the mixture. And it just, it's only four ingredients, but to do it right, really takes something. Okay. Um, and a friend of mine who lived in Italy for, for quite a while gave me some some lessons on it. And I feel like I perfected oh. it. So nice. anyone who actually would kind of know food, like I'm making this for you. Give me your, your expert opinion. This better be good. Yeah, <laughs> man, that's great. So, I mean, obviously you're in the energy industry, but is do you do any side hustle cooking stuff or is it more just a personal enjoyment? Oh, just personal. It, it's just a way to turn the brain off. You know, I, I'll put on a podcast, uh, yeah. listen to some music and, and just cook. Yeah. 
Good for you, Matt. Right on. Is it, was that always like growing up? Were you like that? Or as an adult, no. you started doing it? No way. Um, when my wife, my wife and I've been married for 10 or 11 years, 11 years. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was a sandwich guy, right? Sandwich and hot dogs. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. She, she, she kind of, uh, got me out of that engineer mindset, which is very much, you know, measured down to the, the decimal point, and, you know, mix, yeah. blah, blah, blah. She, she got me more to do by feel, right? Do, do by feel and taste. Ah. Once I turn that page, it's like, th this is actually a very good transition for my day-to-day -day job. This is a relaxing thing for me. So interesting. So yeah. slightly therapeutic in a way. A bit. Yeah. A bit. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. So, so where are you from? I think, I don't know if we mentioned it on the podcast or before, but tell us where you're from. Um, North Dallas. So I, I grew up in the, the, you know, Northern Dallas suburb area, um, high school and stuff there did undergrad at Texas tech, did engineering. Okay. Moved back, moved back to DFW, um, when I was working at Cummins for a long time. And then kind of from there bounced back and forth between Houston for a while, different jobs. And after I finished the gym program, uh, that's when I went to Houston permanently. So it's, I guess, five years ago now, 2017, we've been down here and in Houston near the Galleria inside the loop, which nice. that's a, a whole other story in itself with all the, all the people and the craziness. But. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to rewind a little bit. Um, you mentioned you went to Texas tech uh, for engineering. So were you very studious kind of a STEM student growing up or did you just, I mean, why engineering? Um, I gr grew up building cars. Um, ah. Just, you know, with, with my dad and grandpa and stuff. Um, my, my first car when I was 15 was a 71 Chevelle. And so I, you know, complete build an engine swap and swap transmissions. You know, I, we could really nerd out if you want all the details on this, but, um, <laughs> Go for it. There and then, you know, more cars built a 28 Ford coupe and it just kind of, it was in my blood to do hands-on things. Okay. Uh, I actually started undergrad as a physics major, which ah. looking back, maybe not the best choice. Cause I think at some point mid first year, I realized there's no career in that unless you're going to go into academia and I wasn't doing that. So that's when I switched over to, to the mechanical side of stuff. And, um, yeah, just, you know, super random how things work out. Um, my first job at Cummins, I actually got an internship there because I met my, who would have been my boss through a car club. Um, really? he, had a, he had a 68 or 69 Camaro. I had my 71 Chevelle. We just kind of met and connected one day and it set things off. Well, you know, it's, it, that just adds to, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in networking and, and it's, you know, they always say, oh, your network is your net worth or, you know, whatever cool saying everyone has out there. But ultimately, I mean, look, your career kind of started off because you were part of a, a club and, and you were networking and you had, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd built, I'm sure a level of whether it's trust or, or credibility or just, wow, this, you know, this gentleman here is, is, is top notch, but, but that kind of sits you out on your path. And so, um, you know, for the young listeners out there, and, and there's a lot of students that will reach out on LinkedIn and, you know, hey, I'm graduating, like, what's the best advice you can give me? And I'm just like, get out there and meet as many people as you can and add value in however that looks like. Um, but but yeah, a, a cool story. And so you've been, uh, you were at Cummins for quite a while. And, and I think, and, and so you, but you also had experience on, you said you'd been on drill sites, frac sites. Um, what, what were you doing? And what was your sort of your discipline while you were doing that? So when I was at Cummins, I was an application engineer for most of the time. So say okay. um, like Halliburton or someone wanted to, to build new frack rig, you know, being the engine guy, we would help them spec out the engine, how they needed it for what they needed to do. Right. But then also help them design cooling systems or hydraulic systems or other stuff to basically integrate that engine that we were selling into their entire vision of what that, like the frack rig, for example, what it would look like. Um, uh. And then also after the fact, there's a lot of testing that has to get done to do you know, system validation, that sort of stuff to make sure things were designed well. Um, a lot of documentation on just kind of what that looks like after this whole design process is done. And then after the fact that, you know, there's some support, you know, on stuff like that, say you have a different transmissions that have to meet to the engines and maybe there's some engine tuning that needs to get done to make sure things work out well. So there's on-site, on-the-fly type work that goes on post-design and it was just every everything was different every day because you can support so many different um, customers and equipment builders who have their own vision of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and the techno technology is all always changing on the diesel engine side because emissions regulations and stuff get cleaner and cleaner. So you're always learning new technology, how to implement that stuff, and and then still you kind of get you get to lean back on the engineering background with like thermodynamics and cooling systems. And so it was kind of a really cool mix of hands-on, but also the the schooling side of stuff. 
Yeah, no, that, that's really neat, man. I've got an engineering background myself. And so, um, you know, I, I can identify with you there. And, and you know, I, I would imagine, you know, you've, you've probably identified yourself as someone who's not, I mean, you're, you're, and again, no disrespect to, you know, but the fellow engineers out there, but a lot of times they kind of stick to their work. They're, you know, they're very, um, a lot of binary, a lot of math, and, and they just, they have a certain, you know, mindset. Um, you seem like sort of outspoken and, and you know, like to, to, to discuss and chat and get out there. I mean, like I said, earlier on the podcast, you were testifying, um, you know, in front of the government there. And so, uh, you know, it, have you always kind of had that outspoken sort of, you know, people person type uh, kind of character or? Um, you know, I would say most of my early life. No, absolutely not. Very okay. reserved and shy. And then kind of in my time at Cummins, because of the work I was doing, I, I got to spend a lot of time with our, with our sales guys, with the commercial team. Right. Um, so as we we're kind of designing new stuff and trying to pitch up these companies, they're like, Hey, you know, they kind of raise their hand, like me as a sales guy, maybe I shouldn't be talking about the technical stuff. So why don't you <laughs> cover these stuff? And you just kind of ease into it and get used to speaking in front of people and things like that. And, it, you know, one day something clicks and you're just like, man, once you're the expert on something, there's no need to be nervous about it because like, who, who's going to question you, right? And I, yeah. I mean that in the best way possible, not in a bad way. Sure. Um, so a, a lot of my job now is education, presenting, public speaking, all these, all these things that kind of, uh, we, we have positioned ourselves as the knowledge leaders in our industry and kind of the, the go-to and, you know, the government reaching out to us for stuff. So yeah, yeah, one day it just kind of changes and you realize it's all good. No need to be nervous. Yeah, no, good for you. I think that's awesome. You found yourself and I, I, uh, I love, you know, speaking in front of people and getting out there. Hence why podcast, I love meeting new people. I like talking, I'm in sales and business development. So, you know, I get, I get paid to, to a lot of times just, you know, communicate, articulate a message and, and, you know, face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, customer relations. And so it took me a while to get here, but I, I like you, I, I, I enjoy that part of it. Um, I haven't spoken in front of government yet though. Um, I don't know. They, <laughs> that'd be fun. I would definitely enjoy doing that. Um, they I, say it's out of there. Thing. I don't think I have a, a longstanding desire to do it again. You know, I, I, checked <laughs> okay. the box. I, I told our public affairs team, I'm not jumping ship to your side anytime soon. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Well, look, so, so you made a you know, transition, no pun intended into the space you're in now, which we'll talk about, but I'm curious is, you know, through the transition going from Cummins to where you're at at NST, um, what core belief have you changed your mind over the last few years, you know, with regards to energy, there's a lot of change happening, you know, we have this new uh, inflation reduction act, which is spurring a lot of it, you know, initiative and investment and, and acting on that front. So yeah, how does that kind of, kind of touch you? And, and how do you see that? Um, you know, early on, when I was just supporting the oil and gas industry, it was it was very much, well, not very much, I, I think I had a mindset like, this is where it needs to be. All these other things are ancillary off to the side. They're, they're never going to be as big, whatever oil and gas is where, where it's at. And then you start getting exposed to stuff and realize, okay, maybe not, you know, maybe things are different. And then the gym program, especially you really start getting exposed to not only different technologies, um, but just knowledge, right? Like yeah. reading IEA and EIA reports and just seeing what all is out there and kind of where I'm at now. I guess the big transition mentally for me has been, look, everything has to work together. Yes. You know, no, matter, no matter what the end goal is, if, if the goal is to be cleaner, greener, whatever, however you want to say it, one technology is not going to do it. Everything's got to work together. You can't stay in your silo and just expect everyone else to, to be a flash in the pan. Like they're all going to be together. Yeah, no, that's in, and for me, that's, I've had that mindset shift and I think that's one thing. And especially for, for the folks that are in oil and gas, a lot of the ones who have, who, who have had some humility to say, Hey, look, you know, it's not always us against the world and, and, and do their research and try and get a better understanding of how it all works ultimately. And, and even, you know, I have some folks that I know, on, you know, on the wind side, um, on the power side, um, and in, and ultimately when, when you, when you talk to folks who, who have done the research, everyone tends to agree it's all of the above approach. It's not one or the other. And I think once we have these conversations and, and, and all sides can finally come together and, and, and leverage each other's technologies, skill sets. I mean, you look at offshore wind, who are the best people to work offshore? A lot of the folks that have been drilling offshore for the last 50 years, you know what I mean? So yeah. if, if you can just accept it and invite people in and, and you're starting to see it a lot, and especially 
you know, through the downturn, um, through the pandemic, I know a, a pretty good amount of folks who, um, you know, thought because they had been in oil and gas for five, you know, or years plus were like, well, no one's going to pick me up. But then they quickly realized like they've got some great skill sets. And, and again, I'm not advocating for everyone just to get up and leave oil and gas because we obviously need people, you know, and that's a big challenge for our industry right now is, is, is labor. I mean, just like a lot of other industries. However, um, just that conversation of, of integrating technologies and services and people um, to, to ultimately focus on the North Star of, of providing affordable and you know, reliable and abundant energy to not only us here in the US, but to people who don't have access to any electricity for that matter, um, it's, it's gonna take everybody. Yeah, and like I said, the skills are transferable. You know, like if you're a technician, a, a wrench works the same whether it's on a rig or a windmill, or if you're doing yeah. if you're doing like thermal calculations, right? It works the same whether it, it's doing oil and gas or doing solar or whatever else. Like the knowledge base is there, so there's no need to kind of pigeonhole yourself and just assume you're never going to do anything different. Yeah, no, that's so true. So on a macro level, I mean, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you feel exists within the energy landscape as as we see it today? Um, so I'm in, in terms of the energy landscape, I'm a little more focused on the transportation side of stuff, maybe not grid and other things. So that's kind sure. Of well, let's focus on where you're familiar with. Yeah. I think right now, um, personally, I think it's probably regulatory. And I say that because there's a lot of regulations, a lot of laws, a lot of proposals that seem to be advocating for a certain technology and not being technology agnostic and letting the industry figure out the best path forward, right? Um, in transportation specifically, California, I think yesterday officially said after 2035, no more new gasoline car sales. Yeah, I saw that. that I mean, are they ruling out hybrids? Are they, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of middle ground technologies there. Like just for a piece of regulation to say, absolutely not nothing here when there could be a lot more innovation in that space to be done over the, over the, the future. Right. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, I just, I don't think it's right for the government to be able to come in and say, you have to do this. You cannot do this when really the, the free market's pretty good at finding the best solution to everything. Yes. Um, which good is going to be a combo and which is, you know, technology agnostic is the term, right? Don't, don't, don't rule out anything too early. Yeah, no, I, I, that's interesting that 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 gives a different perspective um, from from a lot of people's answers. And so, you know, it's kind of sticking on the transportation side of things. I mean, that's a huge topic of discussion. Um, I'd love to hear about your experience when you testified in front of the U.S. Senate committee on this exact topic. Um, please share that. Yeah, so um, that specifically was a little different. It wasn't quite my day to day stuff. So there were. Uh, OK. Let me give you a little background here. So Neste, we're the world's largest producer of renewable fuels or renewable products, right? So we make renewable diesel fuel. Um, we make uh, renewable jet fuel or sustainable aviation fuel. We make renewable polymers and chemicals. Um, but part of the point of the testimony was renewable diesel is a hydrocarbon. It's a straight replacement for fossil diesel, right? No, no blend limits, whatever else. It's not the same as biodiesel though. And biodiesel does have these blend limits whether it's 5% or 20% based on whatever. Um, so back in like 2007, there was this Energy Independent Security Act and there were some rules written about pipelines. And because the regulations on biodiesel limited to 5%, we kind of got grandfathered in under that rule, the renewable diesel industry as a whole, even though we're not the same product. So it's it's hurting, hurting, it's, it's, it's hampering us from getting access to pipelines and moving fuel across the country in different markets and stuff because of the limitations and a regulation that was written before we really existed, if that makes sense. So yeah, we're kind of trying, the point was to educate the, the legislators, the senators that the product we're talking about is just, it's fully fungible with fossil diesel. It shouldn't be subject to any of these crazy rules. Give us access to the, the pipelines full, you know, fully so we can go expand the market. Um, Hmm. And I, I think we did well, you know, we didn't know it had any crazy questions for us. Um, it was very much, they're very positive. Um, wanted to talk about not only what we're doing now, but future technologies and everything else and how the, the market's going to grow. So yeah, I think, I think it went well. Um, cool. Hoping, so hoping to move forward on it. Yeah. And I, I would imagine it, it's probably too early to tell, but, but it was there any immediate sort of outcomes or like, did they grant you anything specific or, or like what, what no. was... So I, I, um, 
and th this is me not having a public affairs background, just what I've learned from our team. I guess this is more of like a, the, the first round of conversations trying sure. to, to move these things forward. So it's Senate like S4038 or something, go look it up. Um, trying to get the ideas out there, put a lot of things in the public record so that later when they have more discussions, they can go back and reference these things. So I had to, uh, it's, it's submitted a written testimony that was about six pages long, super nerdy, um, really <laughs> nice. in the week. And then in person, you get a five minute opening statement and then there's questions back and forth. And you could kind of tell even on their side, the things they were saying, they were just kind of reading to put it in the record. They're like, they, they weren't talking to me or for me or, or whatever else. It was just like, I'm going to put this statement verbally out there so that in a year from now, when we come back to reference all this stuff, we remember what we're doing here. And it, it could be a year, it could be two years, three years, who knows? That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I guess, again, it, I'm sure it's, it's a long lengthy process and, and, and understanding more now it's like you said, it's, it's for filing and referencing purposes. And hopefully, hopefully there are multiple rounds of conversation. Uh, I think obviously, you know, the more conversations I had, you know, the art will be better. Um, so kind of going back to the renewable diesel side, you, you, you kind of explained it, but, but why does it play a critical role in the future of energy or, or for someone who out there who's, who's, cause I mean, you're starting to see, you know, renewable diesel and then you're starting to see um, uh, what's the other one, biofuels and biodiesels and, you know, on a, on a macro level, wh where's the benefit and, and why should folks consider or at least appreciate the, the direction that that industry is going? Yeah. Um, it kind of depends on your perspective, I guess. If you're, if you're the fleet manager, the guy just trying to keep the trucks up and running, there are some day-to-day -day performance benefits and lower cost of maintenance and stuff. But okay. the bigger deal is lower GHG emissions, lower carbon emissions, because mm. a fossil a fossil fuel, whether it's gasoline, diesel, whatever else, right? It's made from carbon that's been sequestered underground for a couple hundred million years, right? So the analogy I use is, you know, think of the atmosphere as a sponge. If you're using a fossil based fuel, you're just trying to fill the sponge more and more and more. And at some point the sponge is full, right? And whatever that means, I don't know. Um, but we crossed over that 400 PPM atmospheric CO2 level quite a while ago. Um, what, what the renewable fuel industry is doing, renewable diesel specifically, we're using biogenic carbon. So stuff that's above ground recently, whether it's animal fat, used cooking oil, um, you know, technical corner, there, there's a whole list of stuff. But it's carbon that's been above ground recently. So it, back to the analogy, it's like wringing out the sponge and filling it up again, and wringing it out and filling it up again. So we're not actually adding to that atmospheric carbon load. So it, it it's a way to not make things worse okay. to help the situation. But it's also something available right now because, you know, unlike hydrogen and electric and whatever else, you've got to install charging stations or hydrogen compression or make the hydrogen, whatever else. We're making a hydrocarbon. Like we can use outside of that, <laughs> the Senate bill, right? We can use the same infrastructure, the same pumps, the same tanks, everything mm -hmm. else. It's, it's a drop in thing you can do right now to make a difference. And yeah, and that's what we want people to realize, right? It's a, it's a t today solution, if you will. What? Well, so, in kind of just as you're speaking, I'm thinking for companies, I mean, it, I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a, it's a great way, it's, it's a great way for companies to adopt renewable fuels to help with scope three emissions is it not uh one and three yeah um or of course across, yeah across one across yeah. The board. so yeah it, a lot of companies are having are putting out their own ghd reduction mandates or their own you know esg goals and everything else and it literally like you said it it's a great way to right now make a difference in that and start start chipping away and hammering away at those goals that you've set for the next 20 or 30 years right um in, you know, depending on where you are in the world, whether it's you know East Coast or sorry West Coast, where there's the carbon markets and stuff, you can get these fuels at near parity with the fossil fuels you're already buying. So it's okay. It's kind of a in my in my mind, it's a no brainer. But yeah, of you know, course, I've, yeah, of course, it, that makes sense. So, uh, are you seeing a lot of say, you know, because because one of the biggest you know emitters and and fossil fuel burning industries is, is obviously transportation like we're talking about but but mainly you know ships traveling globally you know around the world um are, are you starting to see more ships and, and companies like Maersk and, and these big companies adopting these renewable fuels or yeah uh for sure so renewable diesel specifically is more like the the, the lighter on-road truck type stuff where the, the big vessels you're talking about that run more like a heavier fuel oil 
bunker fuel, those, those type of terms you hear. Yeah. Um, even then, you know, we, we've got some solutions in that space too. Um, we've got, you know, what we call co-processed biofuels with the new sulfur um, limitations and things. So yeah, anyone, anyone who's making renewable fuels is, is looking into renewable marine fuels and everything else. And yes, the, the big companies you mentioned, Maersk and, and all the others are out there trying to make a difference. So I think, you know, as, as we get more, um, let's just say infiltration, that's not the right word, <laughs> more, more market acceptance in uh, like in the trucking and on-road stuff, you yeah. just get more awareness, more, more visibility across the other industries too. And they're, they're all going to come along as well. Right. So like hypothetically speaking, if say Ford or a company makes a vehicle that can run off this stuff, it's, I would imagine it's going to be an easier transition than say going with EVs because EVs you need to set up charging stations, this and that, but could like a gas station retrofit themselves to have these renewable fuels? I'm assuming they could. So what, what we make renewable diesel, there is, there's not even any retrofitting. Um, oh. You can, you can literally use the same, tanks and pumps and everything because it's a hydrocarbon right just okay. it's just it's from a different source um like you don't have to change anything so okay. it, it's really i think it's more supply and demand um sure you know it, it, take, it takes a lot of investment to build the facilities to make this because it's you know a biodiesel you could make it in your garage so there's some shows on discovery channel people doing this right um, okay <laughs> renewable diesel is more of a uh, it's more of a refinery operation right you need hydro treaters and isomerization units and that sort of stuff and um like we're expanding our, our singapore refinery right now kind of doubling its capacity doing a little copy paste on the first unit to build a second yeah it's like 1.6 billion dollars oh, so wow. it, it's not cheap so that's the thing um i think ah. it seems like the market is starting to demand it a lot more it just takes time and money to make it happen so yeah Okay. I mean, that's, it's kind of like, you know, you're starting to see a lot of, a lot more hype about LNG, and especially with everything that's been happening. Um, you know, natural gas certainly has a, has a pretty decent runway here. And so you're starting to see you know, a lot of people here within the U S and even Canada, um, you know, investing in these LNG facilities, but, you know, similarly, like they're in the billions, uh, it could be, yeah. you know, but, but the outcome is obviously sort of favorable to what we're trying to achieve, uh, you know, globally, uh the is and recently and the reason so aside from the inflation reduction act i'm assuming there's some incentives there that are going to support your industry yeah um i don't know about there specifically but there's are there's more like state-based programs like california okay. has lcfs the low carbon fuel standard right and real quick what that what that program does basically imagine a downward sloping line um over time with the state carbon emissions wanting to be dropped by a certain percentage every year. Yeah. And if you're producing fuel and selling it in the state, if you're below that carbon footprint, you generate credits. If you're above it, you're, you're negative credits and you have to go buy a credit from some, someone else. Right. So the, the playing field kind of gets leveled. Mm. Um, renewable fuels can generate quite a few credits because they're very clean. So give you a, just a high level number. So we're talking like grams of CO2 per megajoule is the unit they talk about for emissions, right? Mm -hmm. Diesel in California around the number, call it 100. When you look at this global carbon footprint of renewable diesel, we can drop that by up to 75%. We can get down to like 25 or 30. Wow. So there's a huge delta there between what we're doing and what the fossil guys are doing right now. So those, those market incentives, um, drive a lot of investment. They drive a lot of product out to the West Coast. Mm. Um, but as more and more states start passing regulations like this, you'll see this product move kind of across the country, right? Um, mm. Like I think just earlier this year, New Mexico missed by like one vote for getting a program put in place. Mm. Uh, there's a coalition of states up in the Northeast trying to get a regional program put in place. Um, yeah, it's really again kind of back to the regulatory environment right um we're almost we're not at their mercy but we're, we're waiting to see what they do before we do a lot of stuff sure but but over time i mean let's just call it over the last five or six years and maybe covid's house you know had, kind of threw a wrench in it but like you've seen a pretty good growth rate in 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 this industry or yeah yeah so we we were the first we we started developing this technology back in the 90s for renewable diesel specifically sorry um okay developed it in the 90s started producing in like 2005 and then <clears throat> in 2016 17 somewhere in there 17 really started branding and trying to push it out there as, as like a you know renewable diesel product that everyone needs to buy 
since then, you've, we've seen a lot of the oil majors start to come over also, like P66 is converting a facility, Chevron's doing some work. We announced a joint venture with Marathon to take a refinery in Martinez, California and convert it over to this as well. So oh. you, get, you get a lot more majors coming into this too. It's not just, you know, no name, quote unquote, um, sure. non household type names doing it. Huh. But, but you guys were, you know, would be considered kind of the experts in this field then, obviously? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. only because we've been doing it for so long. Um, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, aside from, you know, regulatory challenges and, and perhaps some resistance on that front, I mean, from a technological standpoint, are there any limitations or kind of challenges that, that, that you guys or, or the industry are trying to overcome? Um, technologically, no. As far as like implementation goes, putting it into equipment, no, because it is a pure hydrocarbon. It's fully fungible. You can do whatever you want, right? Put it in the same infrastructure, same vehicles, and you're actually going to see some benefit. Mm. Um, we do, we do get a lot of questions about feedstock supply because, you know, if we're talking used cooking oil and, and animal fat and stuff, that there's obviously not infinite supply of that. Yeah. Um, and especially with more players coming into the market, we get a lot of questions like, are we going to run out of, you know, French fry oil and that sort of stuff? So, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think from our perspective, we put a lot of money into um, research and development, kind of future technologies. So yeah. we've got... We're kind of playing in the first feedstock bucket right now. We've got five or six other technologies out there ahead of us with lignocellulosics and municipal solid waste and algae and carbon capture, power to X, all that sort of stuff. So oh, wow. I, I, I think, honestly, the only limitations are regulatory and then just getting the, the, the money to go do the stuff. Um, yeah. Huh. No, that's interesting because I'm so my career is in drilling fluids and, you know, just like everyone else. Uh, we've been at the mercy of these, this global supply chain disruption and a lot of the raw materials that we use, interestingly enough, we, you know, our supply chain and, and our purchasing group said, Hey, supposedly, you know, these biodiesel and biofuel companies are scooping up all, a lot of our raws that we typically have. And so that we've had to navigate those waters, um, you know, mainly things like uh, TOFAs and the CTO or uh, crude, to crude tall oils, uh, and then yeah. a lot of the vegetable oils. Uh, and so is that, I mean, is, are those, I mean, is that true? Like, are you guys scooping up a lot I of mean, the. Yeah. So a, a lot of those oils, um, what, what we really want out of that is a fat molecule, the triglyceride. Right. And so okay. a lot of those products have an ideal fat molecule in, like crude, like tall oil pitch and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So not only can you make fuels out of that, you guys are doing your thing out of that. Even the fuel additive industry need some of those too. Like the, the guys who make lubricity improvers for fuels and other stuff like that. Everyone's yeah. kind of going after the same stuff. So yeah, they're uh, every, every now and then you can get people fighting against each other for the same stuff. Yeah. The drilling fluid markets look, looking at you guys like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, hey, no, it's good. It's, it's for the greater good. You know what I mean? It's all good, yeah. but, uh, but no, it's interesting. Cause you know, we, we sit on our side of the fence and you know, we, we don't have a, you know, any, any sort of inside scoop as to what it is. All, all, all our suppliers are saying a lot of the supply that you guys used to get now is going to this industry. And we're just like, yeah. okay, well, and then, so then for us back to the drawing board, what other molecules can we use to, to then manufacture our products? And, and we're vertically integrated. So we are sourcing a lot of these raws from overseas. And, and so, you know, a, a lot of like, you know, just, just the, the vegetable oils and all these other things, um, you know, they, they play a big role in, in our, uh, you know, supply chain side of things. So anyway, it's just kind of interesting to hear you talk about, I'm like, ah, okay, this is, this is real. Like our, 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 our suppliers are not just BSing us or this is true. Uh, we're all on the same page. We're all going after the same stuff. And that's why I mentioned all those other, the future technologies. Cause you know, at some point we're, we're going to need to move on to some other stuff too. So, and you know, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I know our group is constantly scrounging the market for different things. And so, um, but, but no, ultimately, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear kind of what's happening and, and where you're headed with it. Where do you, do you see, um, I mean, for you know, a company like Nesty, what is your vision and an ultimate goal for sort of this industry? Where, where do you see this in say 10 years from now, 15 years from now? Um, you know, I think, Day to day, our kind of mission statement is create a healthier planet for our children, right? So whatever we do, it's going to be to 
lower carbon emissions and other stuff. And one of our goals is we look at our customers emissions, which I guess would be is that scope three. I, mean, I forget the, the, the nomenclature there sometimes. Yeah, no, uh, it'd likely be scope threes. Yeah. Yeah. We've said by 2030, we want to help our end users c collectively reduce their emissions by 20 million tons a year. You know, hmm. we're, we did 10.9 last year. So oh, wow. we've, we've got a long ways to go, That's, which is why we're doing refinery expansions and stuff. But I think yeah, over time, I mean, you look at IEA and other estimations of transportation fuels and what it's going to take to, to green everything up. Even if you look out to 2040, I think uh, like right now, maybe two thirds of all oil consumption goes into transportation. And if you look, take that two third bucket out at 2040, in that two thirds, um, you could take care of a third of that with EV and probably a third of that with, with biofuels and stuff, but you still have a huge petroleum chunk in the middle there. Hydrogen may take up some of that too, but I mean, yeah. it, it's not like the market's gonna get saturated. Um, you know, it's at no point is anyone gonna say we don't need any more of this. So I guess from our perspective, it's just a, let's go as hard and fast as we can and try to do as much as quickly as possible to try to make a yeah. difference. No, that's awesome. And so, you know, again, you may, or I mean, you may or may not be familiar with, with this side of your, your team or, or your organization, but on the marketing front, um, when you're trying to get out there and, and do branding initiatives and things like that, would you say the biofuel industry does a good job of that? Or do you think it needs work? Like essentially like communicating the message to the general population, is that being done effectively for you guys? You know, I think we're obviously getting a lot better. Um, our new marketing team is doing some great work just to get the message out there. But I think everyone's just so, most people don't think about the fuel they put in their car, right? You, you go to the, the, the gas station and you put gasoline right. in your car. Like, yeah. I don't know if you have any brand loyalty. You may go to Shell one day, Exxon the next day, whatever. It's just a liquid. It's a commodity. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, we, are, we are trying to do a lot of work to fight that, the commoditization, I guess. Uh -huh. Because even within the renewable fuel space, some people blend with other stuff. Some some are better qualities than others. And we choose to sell our fuel unblended, best quality we can get every day of the week. Um, so, you know, we're trying to create a solid brand for ourselves. Industry as a whole, though, I, I think it's just tough because it's not on the front of people's minds. You know, yeah. it's just, I, I need to go to the grocery store. Oh, but I need gas on the way. So let me just stop in real quick. It's not like, yeah, you, you don't you don't have loyalty like you would to something else in your life, right? Yeah, no, that's an interesting. So when you say sell, so who like does a company nasty? Who who do they like? What's a company that they sell to, or what's a customer? Is it like a gas, like the the fuel stations, so or what? We're we're more um, business to business level stuff. So we actually we don't sell fuel directly. We have a network of distributors and channel partners on the West Coast, and they were okay. the ones who sell it to market. But like say, City of Oakland, every diesel engine run in the City of Oakland fleet runs on our fuel. Okay. Um, or, or private fleets, you know, uh, whether it's um, like Penske. Penske is doing a lot of work in Southern California with our fuel, just or even down to individual agriculture, like farmers and things, or backup power gen for data centers. Like it's more, it's the B2B style. And I think in my opinion, that's more because the owners of those fleets are more invested in the fleet and keeping yeah. it up, keeping it running, saving some money. And it's not just, you know, I, I bought a Honda Accord and I need to put some gas in it. So there's a little more kind of commitment on their side. Yeah, um, we get to build a relationship there. So yeah, we're you know, private fleets, public fleets, municipalities, that sort of stuff. Okay, cool. No, I just again, this is a totally new uh, sort of environment for me. So I was just, you know, I'm, I may be asking dumb questions, but I'm trying to learn and, and hopefully the audience is too. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Yeah. Well, uh, man, this has been a fascinating conversation. Like I said, it's something that I'm not familiar with. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, the listeners were able to take away some things. But uh, before we close out, I, I do always like to kind of close out with some sort of some fun sort of kind of, uh, you know, personal style questions, not too invasive though. So don't worry. Um, okay. <laughs> but uh, what's again, what's something about yourself that not many people know about? I mean, you got any good hidden talents or, I mean, you mentioned shooting and, and doing some bow hunting and stuff, but kind of anything else that's sort of interesting and unique about yourself that, that you enjoy aside from, you know, you know, working working your butt off to, to get biofuels and renewable fuels to, to the market? Man, that's a good question. Um, I have not thought about that. Um, let's see. Give me five seconds here. No worries. We got, we got time. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. 
I used to do a ton of cycling. Um, okay. Like road biking. Um, okay. It's kind of interesting. So did you wear the, the tight shorts and the tight, the, like the tights? There's the aerodynamic gear. Are you going to make me admit to that publicly? <laughs> well, I, I don't publish the video, so no one really cares what it'll look like. They're like, oh, this guy's a speedster. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah for, for a couple of years there, um, Trek, the, the bike company is based up in Wisconsin. They do, do a ride every summer called the Trek 100. And oh, basically cool. start, start a factory and it's a hundred mile ride out across the Wisconsin countryside and back. And we did that a couple of years and, um, Pretty fun stuff. I'm, I'm looking around my office here, trying to think what may be interesting to people. I don't, I don't really know if I have anything. <laughs> Dude, well, you, so you're, a, you're, a, you're, a, you're a roadster. That's cool. Uh, and then you, you said you bow. Is it you bow hunt then, or because you, you said in the, yeah. in the beginning you said okay. So tell yeah, us about so, that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just, it, just a fun hobby. Um, you know, I, I used to do a lot of um, like rifle and pistol shooting and stuff, and it just sounds bad. It's kind of, it's, it's point and click at some point, and like. It's, there's not the, the challenge isn't there unless you're getting onto really long distance stuff and you can't do that when you live in Houston you got to go out in the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. arch, archery though it, it's it's kind of a, it's like a zen thing you know you kind of yeah. just focus in on the target whether it's 20 30 40 yards whatever shoot five arrows at a time and kind of just hang out turn the brain off. Um, it's all, it's like like guy meditation I guess I don't know. Yeah hey what I mean whatever works I you know people find that place doing lots of different things. For me, it's being in the gym. I mean, I, and then, yeah. you know, when I do get to golf, that's amazing too. But for me, it's being in the gym in the morning. I, I start my mornings every morning uh, in the gym and that kind of sets, sets me up and, and gives me that sort of time to disconnect and listen to the right music and go from there. So, um, but uh, I guess, you know, I really enjoy golf. I grew up playing baseball. So I, my, my swing doesn't transfer over. I have the world's worst slice. I'll probably actually end up hurting someone one day. So I don't do it. <laughs> So do you play at all or is it just for fun no, sometimes? No. Okay. Like driving range at best. Cause I realize how bad I am. <laughs> yeah. I, so I grew up playing baseball and that's, that's been a challenge for me and I've managed and I, I play more now than, than I used to, you know, I've been fortunate enough to do so, but yeah, this, the slice for me has been tough. I didn't play hockey growing up. I'm from Canada. I didn't play hockey. I, I played football and snowboarded. Um, so I just, the, the scheduling there didn't quite fit with the hockey schedule, but uh, played a lot of baseball and man, that was, that doesn't transfer. Although I know a lot of folks that have played hockey growing up, they actually have a really good, um, a lot of them have a good golf game. So I don't know how the, the, the hockey, uh, slap shot transfers, but apparently it does. So, but I'm with you on the being, slice, man. <laughs> being Canadian, not playing hockey, do they try to take your citizenship or anything? I, well, I know. Right. <laughs> and I don't really particularly like beer. So maybe that's why I, I'm not, I don't live there anymore. They slowly squeezed me out. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, no. And so, I mean, one last question for you, Matt, then, you know, do you have any daily habits or routines that, that contribute to your success? You're obviously a busy man. Um, you know, I probably need to get back into having daily habits. Um, that's, it's a good thought. No, I, I, the, the schedule is always crazy because our company is global. Um, we're based globally in Finland and Helsinki. So uh -huh. their day's ending is my day is starting. So some days, you know, it's the meetings start right away or even earlier than right away. Um, interesting so i think time management is one of those things that can get out of hand sometimes because having yeah. people in helsinki and in just all over europe but also here plus west coast us and we've got a refinery in singapore it just hmm. no that, that you know what that's a good reminder i need i need some new some good daily habits. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't let me throw you off here you're gonna get off this pot like damn it i need some routines now Shit, here we go seriously uh, <laughs> well so be so have you got the opportunity to go to finland yeah. Um, I usually go once or twice a year. I'm going to head back over there in the next month or two. Um, oh, cool. Helsinki is a really cool city. Um, it, it's okay. Yeah. It's, it's very cool. So it's not too far from St. Petersburg. So architecture wise, there's a lot of similarities to kind of that Eastern Russia, St. Petersburg style. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's not Russian. So I've got, got, got that going for them. Um, <laughs> okay. so but there's a lot of really cool out outdoors things to do, you know, a lot of history. Um, it's a very wooded yeah. country. So if you like, like Colorado or something, you would love Finland. Um, really? That is. I've had, had a chance to go to our Singapore refinery. Singapore is an amazing city. I've heard. I've not been there, but anyone that I've spoken to that's traveled there says they really like it. Yeah, it was really awesome. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the travel I get to do in this day is definitely a perk. Definitely something I don't want to lose. It's fun. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, I, I've. I mean, others aside from Canada and the U S our company is pretty much, you know, based here in North America, but, um, 
you know, there's, I mean, energy is global, right? And so anyone out there who's, who's tied to energy likely is going to do some traveling over their career. And it sounds like you've been to some amazing places and um, man, this has been a good conversation. If, if the listeners are, are curious to, to learn more about anything we talked about today, are there any good resources online to learn maybe your guys's website, maybe you have some white papers. I mean, what, are, is there anything yeah. that if people want to chew on a little more, what, what's a good spot to, to, to check out? The easiest thing, and not to be the, the corporate shill, um, our website, it's so Neste, N-E-S-T-E, my, M-Y, dot com. Okay. That'll take you to our, to our U.S. page. And there, there's a ton of information there. There's some links to some white papers, um, it, a, lot, a lot of good information. You could also, we have what we call a renewable diesel handbook. That, okay. You know, we, we just updated it last year. It's probably 50 or 60 pages. And it, it's, it's a bit more of a deep dive. So you could Google Neste Renewable Diesel Handbook. Um, that that will that will, if you're a nerd, you're gonna love it. If you're not a nerd, it's gonna put you to sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> other no, than that, that's... honestly, just you know, re- reach out on LinkedIn or whatever else. Um, we're always here. We we want to position ourselves as kind of the knowledge leaders in the market, right? The thought leaders. Um, yeah. So we're always open for questions. Uh, we do a lot of a lot of educational type stuff for customers, potential customers, whoever. Um, we're, we're an open book. Perfect. No, I think that's fascinating. And I hope the listeners enjoyed it just as much as I did. And I encourage all the listeners to reach out, connect with Matt, uh, you know, you post uh, on LinkedIn. And so, yeah, just to increase your knowledge base on this is, is I think extremely important. Um, and again, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put all the links in the show notes. That way uh, people can just scroll down while they're listening and uh, click the links. I'll put your LinkedIn and the, the website, I'll, the link to the handbook and all the rest of it. So uh, Matt, again, thank you for listening and for all, or for uh, joining me today and for the listeners, please review, subscribe, share it with anyone who you think might find this interesting. Uh, please reach out to me if you'd like to sponsor the show. And until next time, always remember everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody.